Yeah. I didn't want to just have everybody's uh, lab group names there on YouTube, like you all didn't you know, ask for that. So. Okay, so, so um, today what we're going to do is we're going to um, sort of continue our fundamental topics, um, which is we're going to continue our discussion with statistics and how we can apply that uh, for uh, assessing survey accuracy, uh, as well as being able to classify surveys based on the results that we get. Uh, and then we're going to go through some basic computations uh, in land surveying. And, and I'll level with you this um, uh, section regarding basic computations. I'm not going to get into very significant detail on because it's really just a review of some basic algebra, basic trig um, that you all should have seen uh, in, in previous courses. So um, that'll just sort of be a, a, a basic refresher uh, as it were. Okay. So let's uh, start talking about uh, assessing surveys and ultimately classifying them. Uh, and uh, to sort of set the stage, so in our previous lecture, um, what we did is we recognized, so, so we did a lot of um, discussion regarding error in observations. And notice that there are uh, systematic errors, there are environmental errors, random errors that we sort of can't get around, we can't get away from. Uh, in real world uh, uh, measurements that, that you just can't get away from, okay? Um, and, uh, but we do know that one way of at least minimizing that error is to repeat measurements over and over again. So if you have uh, a distance that you want to measure and you measure that distance repeatedly using the, a, a repeated process, the same process, um, there will be some scatter in that data, but you can characterize that scatter with, you know, uh, trying to compute the mean, computing the standard deviation, et cetera. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, um, the mean and standard deviation will characterize your specific data set, but if you want to continue it one step further and sort of try and predict data based on that data set, you need a probability distribution. And the most um, uh, uh, ubiquitous for probability distribution, so I'll skip past this because we all know what the standard deviation is, but the most ubiquitous or the most common probability distribution is a normal distribution. Sometimes called a Gaussian distribution. You might have heard the term bell curve before. I get the feeling you all have probably seen this uh, in some fashion or another. Am I right? Has anybody not seen a bell curve before? Okay. All right. So, um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So a normal distribution uh, is intended to predict um, or to represent uh, random variables. Um, and what we find from statistics and what we find uh, from the central limit theorem is that as you have a given observed phenomenon, such as measuring distances, and this it could be anything, it could be something in physics, something in chemistry, just any natural phenomenon. As the number of samples uh, for that random variable increases, that distribution converges to a bell curve. Okay. And if you graph the, the normal distribution, it sort of looks like this, and, and it's got this sort of bell shape, hence why it's sometimes referred to as a bell curve, um, developed by Gauss, hence why Gaussian distribution, you know, et cetera. Um, so the, the normal distribution is among the most common probability distribution that we use uh, as engineers and scientists to represent uh, random variables. And so when you're plotting it, essentially how far to the left or right the curve is plotted is a function of where the, uh, the mean is or the average is. So this blue curve, this red curve, and this yellow curve all have the same average or most expected value. This green curve, the average is a little less. It's a lower average, so that's why it shifted over to the left. And as for the shape of the curve, whether it's you know, sort of narrow and tall or it's, it's um, sort of short and, and, and wide, is a function of the standard deviation. So the smaller the standard deviation, the more assurance you have about your data. So whenever you have a really small standard deviation, your normal distribution is narrow and tall because you're, the, the amount of confidence that you have uh, about your data, your, your, your data is sort of centered around that, that, um, that mean. Whereas if you have a, a lot of scatter in your data, you have less assurance and that, that bell curve uh, gets spread out. Does that make sense? Now, in order to plot a normal distribution, you do need to 
uh, essentially two data points. You need a mean and you need a standard deviation. So let's go back to the in-class example that we did last time. Okay, um, this is a, uh, a data set that we computed the mean and the standard deviation for, and we got that for that data set, it was 20, 23, 22, et cetera. We got that the mean was 23 and the standard deviation was about 2.6, okay? So this is what the uh, normal distribution or the bell curve looks like for that data set. So you can see along the x-axis, it's centered at 23 because that was the mean of our data. And then how um, narrow or wide that distribution is plotted is a function of what the standard deviation is. So in this case, the standard deviation uh, is 2.6, okay? Everybody with me so far on the plot? Okay, all right. Now, um, one of the things that we um, uh, uh, tend to perform uh, uh, in the land of mathematics is an integral, right? Uh, and if a derivative is intended to help us find the slope of a tangent line, what is an integral uh, uh, intended to, uh, to do? What do we use integrals for? Find the area under the curve. The area under the curve. It's 100% right. Okay? Those are the two fundamental questions that calculus answers, the slope of the tangent line and the area under a curve. Okay? Now, the way a probability distribution works, it goes on forever. Okay? This goes uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity. So, so that, that curve uh, goes on forever. Okay? Um, but what we can do is determine areas under the curve as a function of the standard deviation. Okay? So like, for example, if I had a bell curve that, let's say here was my bell curve, and here's my bell curve, and I asked, okay, so here's the center. Um, while this goes on forever, what I can characterize is I can say that's 50% of the area, right? And so this might be, you know, if I drew a line here, this might be 60%, this might be 70%, et cetera, right? Um, I can't, you know, going from an, you know, negative infinity to positive infinity, I can get 100% of the area, but I can, uh, I can express that as also as a function of standard deviations. Now, what I have here on this slide is a shaded area, the shaded blue area. And what I'm doing is I'm going from the mean, okay, and I'm going one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right. Okay, so the standard deviation is 2.6, so I'm going 23 minus that's 20.4 plus that's 25.6, and I've got that shaded area. Okay, now if you've ever seen the expression for the standard deviation, it's kind of messy, uh, and the integrals for that can get kind of messy, but you can look up areas uh, under the uh, bell curve uh, pretty easily. Just Google it. You'll, you'll find tables within a few seconds. Um, but what I propose to you is that the area under that curve, that, that blue shaded area, is about 68% of the total area from negative infinity to positive infinity. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what does that mean for you? Okay. Well, I propose that if you have a given data set, and let, let's just say we're looking plus or minus one standard deviation, okay? So the plus or minus one standard deviation goes from 20.4 to 25.6, okay? I propose that if that area is 68.27%, okay? I propose that if this data fits a bell curve, then I can predict that about 68% of the data is within the range of 20.4 to 25.6. It's not always exact, it's not always that case, but that's what the normal distribution tells us, is that I can use this range to predict how much data fits within that range, okay? So if we're going plus or minus one standard deviation, that's like 68.27%. Those are um, not necessarily very easy ranges to work off of, so instead what we do uh, in the land of surveying is we look at different ranges to achieve target areas, okay? So this is what one standard deviation above and below the mean would be. It's about 68.27%. Two standard deviations above and below the mean would be about 95%. It's a little bit different, but it's about 95%. Um, and so what this tells me over here is about 95% of the data fits between this point uh, in this point. And, and don't worry, we're going to have a, 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 an interactive example on this here in a second. Um, instead of looking at the standard deviation, though, and trying to quantify these percentages, instead what I'm going to do is look at a target percentage and figure out what that range uh, needs to be. 
Hi, I just wanted to step in and mention a quick typo that I had uh, in my lecture. Um, I'm here on slide seven and we're talking about percent errors and there were uh, a couple places where instead of 50, 90, and 95, I had 50, uh, 95, and 99, uh, which the 50, 95, and 99 were incorrect. Uh, ultimately, I was, was going through the notes and I was wondering where I came up with that and that was just a, a typo in a textbook I was using. Um, and I think just in the middle of class, I think there was a couple places where I went with it, but it is in fact 50, 90, uh, and 95, um, as you can see referenced in the, um, the, the uh, percent area under the normal uh, distribution curve that you see here. Uh, the, the, the actual um, uh, uh, coefficients of the, the equations themselves didn't change and nothing that we did uh, in our uh, in-class example changed. Uh, the only thing that, that uh, really had any effect was uh, on these, I had the wrong subscript. Should have been 90 and 95, not 95 and 99. So uh, apologies for the confusion and inconvenience. Uh, and with that, we'll get back to the lecture. And so what we do is we, we have those, we call those percent errors, okay? So what we do uh, in surveying is we essentially define three uh, percent errors. So we have an E50, uh, an E95, and an uh, E99. Okay, so instead of looking at a standard deviation and finding a percent range, it's instead looking for a target percent range and figuring out what that standard deviation needs to be. Now, because the, um, uh, because the standard deviation is a little messy, bless you, uh, because the standard deviation is a little messy, the range of those standards, uh, 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 of those percent errors can be a little messy as well. So what I propose is that, so let's just take E50, okay? So the, what E50 is, and so what we're trying to do is figure out how many standard deviations above and below the mean we need to traverse such that the, that shaded area is 50% of the total area. Uh, and when you chart that out, you find that it's, you know, so look right here. So two standard deviations is 95%, one standard deviation is about 68%, so how many standard deviations need to be 50%? And so you chart that out and you get this sort of, you know, a little bit of a messy uh, decimal here, 0 0.6745. I propose that what I can do is I can compute that range, uh, and that range will tell me um, about with, with what assurance, essentially, that half the data should fall within that range. So the percent error for 95% should tell me that 90 or uh 95% of the data should fall within that range. Same thing with uh, E99, that 99% of the data should fall within this range. And it can be a little bit difficult to sort of wrap your head around without an example. So I think the easiest way to take a look at this is to actually do an example. So I wanna look at this example uh, and, and you'll, you'll kind of see where this is going when we look at this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this data set uh, and we're going to compute the E50, the E90, uh, E95, uh, and E99. Sorry, that's a typo. That should be 95 and 99. Again, I'm allowed seven mistakes a uh, semester. And so we'll call that a 0 0.1 mistake since I caught it. So e, e, uh, E50, E95, E99. So we're going to compute these error limits for this data show. Okay? A lot of this is going to involve the same statistics that we've been looking at this whole time, so we'll call this 95, 99. Okay. Yes? Can you go back real quick to show the, the numbers? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Here you go. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Don't hesitate if you got a question like that. I mean, that's what we're here to do, so. Keep in mind, these slides are, are updated on Blackboard as well, though, so if you miss something, no big deal. Sound good? Yep. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute the, um, the error limits for this data shown. And you'll kind of, you'll get kind of an idea of, uh, of how to wrap your head around this uh, once we do some examples. Okay. So we're going to compute the, um, the, uh, the uh, percent error limits uh, for this data shown. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to do some fundamental statistics, okay? So first off, let's compute uh, the mean or uh, the most likely value. Okay, so 
recall that in order to compute the mean, we're going to take the sum of the measurements and divide it by the number. Okay? So summing the measurements, so notice on this example, some of that um, uh, wrote uh, 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 set of calculations have already been done for you. So I have the sum of the measurements right here. So this is uh, 53, 84, uh, 0.50. Okay, and we're going to divide that by the number of measurements, which is 10, which is 5, 538.45. I think I can do that one in my head. That's just um, uh, uh, tracking the decimal back one place. And so that's in feet. So let me put my units there. So feet and feet. Okay. All right. So uh, next, what we're doing, we're going to do is we're going to compute the standard deviation. All right. And so our expression for the standard deviation is now I'm going to put this plus and minus here. Um, I, I don't think I put that when we did our example in class last time, but you'll kind of see um, why, I'm, why I'm indicating that here. So we have a fraction on top of that. We have the sum of the residual squared. On the bottom of that fraction, we have n minus 1. And we're taking the square root of that whole thing. So we're taking plus and minus the square root of a fraction. On bottom of that is 9. And this is 0 0.0. Let me uh, do that a little better. So 0 0.0554 feet squared over 9, and we're taking the square root of all of that. So what do we get for this? Um, make sure everybody's awake um, with your Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator. When we compute our standard deviation, what do we get for this? So we're taking 0 0.0554 over 9, taking the square root of the whole thing. Say it again. 0 0.078. 0 0.078. Do I have a second on that? A second, yeah. All right. Okay. And to the hundredths place, we'll call that plus or minus 0 0.08 feet. Okay. So far, so good. That 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 part should be pretty easy. Okay. Now, let's take the 50% um, error limit. Okay. Okay, let's just take it one at a time, and you'll, you'll kind of see where this is going. Okay, so E50, so this is how many standard deviations we need to go on either side of the bell curve such that the area is 50%. Uh, and that ends up being uh, plus or minus 0 0.6745 sigma. So that's plus or minus 0 0.6745 times 0 0.08, okay? And so when we chug that out, and we'll just say to two decimal places, what do we get? So it'll, it'll be like 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05, it'll be small, so. 0 0.053. 0 0.05, so we'll call it 0 0.05. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. So this is my E50 limit. Okay, so I want you to think about the, think about the bell curve. So the bell curve is centered around the mean, right? Centered around the mean, and this is my range on either side. So therefore, so let me let me put a little bubble here. Let's, let's put a little bubble here. So let's look at the range. Okay. So here's my mean, right? So what is my mean minus this and my mean plus this? So what would be the range? 538.4 to 538.5. Okay. Does everybody see that? 538.4 to 538.5. So it would be 538.4 feet to 538.5 feet. And essentially what I'm doing 
is I'm taking my mean plus or minus E50. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, here, here's what I'm getting at. I propose that about about 50% of the data points, because I'm looking at my 50% area, that about 50% of the data points should fall in this range. That's what, I'm, that's what an E50 is, okay? Now, is that the case? Is it about 50%? How many data points do fall within this range? Let's, let's count it. Does the first data point fall within that range? No. no. Uh, what about the second one? No. Third one? No. Fourth one? No. What about this one? Yes. What about this one? Yes. What about this one? No. What about this one? Yes. What about this one? Yes. And no. Okay. So I said about 50%. What we have is 4 out of 10. But let's see. But let's see if that happens with um, with other observations. One thing to keep in mind is that we only have four data points. If we did this problem, we had, or sorry, we only have ten data points. If we had fifty data points, we'd probably get a little closer. Okay. Let's see what happens with ninety-five percent. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's look at our ninety-five percent error limit. Let me do this down here. So E95 is plus or minus um, 1.6449 sigma. So plus or minus 1.6449 times 0 0.08. So what is that? 0 0.13. All right, one, three feet. So, somebody tell me what my range is going to be then. What's the lower end of my range? What's the upper end of the range? The lower is... Five thirty-eight point three two. Have a second on that. Yeah. Okay. What about the upper? Point five eight. Five thirty-eight point five eight. So what this is saying, I'm going to erase these X's down here. What this is saying is that ninety-five percent of the data should fit within this range. Does it? Well, let's see. Let's try this again. Okay. Does the first data point fall within that range? Yes. Yes. What about the second? Yes. 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 And they all do, right? So not about 95%. So and what did we get? We got 10 out of 10. Again, as your data number of data points increases, this ratio will get closer to 95%. This one will get closer to 50%. Um, one of the things that's worth noting is that in most survey computations, the one that we tend to have most confidence in is our 95% error limit. But let's go ahead and do the 99%. So E99 is plus or minus, uh, and then this one is, I can remember, 9599. And so, what do we got here? That's 16 or 15? 16. What's that? 16. 
0 0.16. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So our range in this one is going to be what? Um, 5, 38 point, what is that? 2, 9? 2, 5, 38 point, what is that? 6, 1? And if the 95% was 10 out of 10, what's this one going to be? 10 out of 10. Yeah. I'll put here. Most common. That's the one that's most common for characterizing surveying data. Um, again, so that's, the, I would say probably the key word when you're looking at the range is about because the, um, the accuracy or the, um, the, the likelihood that it is actually 50% or actually 95% or actually 99% increases with the number of data points, right? Like you can't even get exactly 99% of the data until you have 100 data points or more, right? Like that wouldn't even be possible, all right? Does that make sense? So that, so you probably saw that on the homework and went, what is going on with these error limits? That's what's going on, is you're basically trying to characterize data and assess how many data points fall within a given uh, error limit. Does that make sense? All right, any questions on this? Should I leave this up for a second or are you all good? All right, so okay. All right. So what I'm going to do now is um, I want to talk about relative accuracy, and I'm going to throw a, a term at you that we're going to start uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, a good bit throughout the semester, and it's this term closure. Um, and and we use closure as well as our collected data to characterize the quality uh, of a land survey. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so let's, but to begin, let me um, talk about closure, okay? So um, one of the things that we're going to do very uh, soon in the class is perform what's called a differential level, okay? And so the way a differential level works is We'll, we're, I'm going to use a couple points here on campus because this is actually going to be um, one of our um, uh, one of our first labs. Is to look at elevations. So I'm going to have a known benchmark. So this is me. You know, take that to the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I'm going to have a point here on the ground. Okay, so here's the ground, and there's this known point here on the ground, and I have a name for that. Okay, I'm going to call it a benchmark. Okay, and let's say that I assume that the elevation of that benchmark is 100 feet, exactly. Whether it's 100 feet or whatever uh, value it is, let us assume for the sake of discussion that the elevation of that point is known, a known quantity. What I am then going to do is reference this benchmark to determine the elevation of an unknown point, okay? Now, for our first um, lab, the elevation of the unknown point is going to be, oh, goodness, that's the best you're going to get. The Memorial Fountain. That's, that's all you're getting out of it. Again, Museum of Modern Art. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take the base, you know how there's that, that sort of marble lip that goes around the building, so that base right there, we're going to determine the elevation of that. So the elevation is going to be unknown. Okay. Now the way that that's going to uh, work is we're going to perform a differential level. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to reference this elevation, and we're in sort of this turn-based survey. Like you set up here to determine the height of this point, and then set up here to determine the height of this point, and it's sort of this like daisy chain of setups and, 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 and measurements until you get to the fountain, 
And then you work your way back, okay? So you start here, work your way to the fountain, and then work your way back, okay? And compute elevations the whole way. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're going to start at 100 feet. Theoretically, you should end at 100 feet. Now, here's the pop quiz. Do you think you're going to end at 100 feet? No, no you're not going to. There's going to be an error, okay? Now, theoretically, what should happen is that the survey should do what we call, it should close. It should start at 100 and end at 100, and we call that closure, okay? But it's not going to. There's going to be a discrepancy, okay? And we call, and so we have a name for that. We call that error the error of closure. And sometimes you'll just hear me, I'll probably just call that closure, okay? So, um, and again, we're going to see that in our first main type uh, of surveying. And so we're going to learn, for example, when we start talking about differential leveling, we're going to learn how to correct for that error. Um, but that's, we'll get to that uh, later when we start talking about leveling. Okay? But for the sake of discussion, um, closure can be taken as the difference between these two independent measurements. So the, L, the measure distance from A to B, let's say you have these two points, you measure the distance from A to B, you get 123.25 feet, but if you measure it from B to A, you get a different distance. So the error would be the difference of those, which would be 0.06 feet. Uh, and for the sake of survey classification and this type of error discussion, the sign doesn't really matter all that much when we're talk, uh, at least for, for what we're talking about here. Um, the sign difference will matter later, but for right now, uh, not so much. Um, now what we can do um, uh, with error, uh, with that closure error, is compute what's called a relative accuracy. Okay, And so to kind of explain what a relative accuracy is, okay, Let's, let's use this, um, this uh, situation here, this uh, differential level, and let's throw some numbers out here. So let's say that the error between here and here and back, let's say that error is half a foot. Does that seem like an acceptable survey? Like if, if, if I'm surveying back and forth and my error is half a foot, does that seem acceptable? What if my error was a hundredth of a foot? Why? Okay, it's smaller. Okay, let me ask you, let me ask you a different way. Okay, let's say that I was doing another survey and I got an elevation difference that was a half a foot but it was an elevation difference between a point in Huntington and a point in Scott Depot. And the elevation difference was off by half a foot. Does that seem as bad? Why? It's still half a foot off. I don't get it. The distance you travel is way greater. Yeah. Half a foot compared to the X amount of miles you travel, that's not too bad. That's 100% right. And what you all are talking about, what you just described, is relative accuracy that your error needs to be taken into context with the measurement it's associated with, okay? So basically what we do in relative accuracy is so what we're saying is that there's one error per every 10,000 units or per every 20,000 units. And so the way that we compute that is we take our measured horizontal distance and we compare that against our closure error. So this survey from here to the memorial fountain up and back the amount of error that we should be allowed to accept is a function of the length of the survey, okay? So um, those standards and what we are allowed to accept have to take that into account. And so you'll see here, for example, we have different classifications for what order and what class of survey uh, uh, we would classify a survey based on the amount of error for a given uh, 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 distance travel. Um, these are some selected standards, and so I'll, um, I'll show you how we utilize this here in a bit. Uh, these are established by the Federal Geodetic uh, Control Subcommittee. Um, but what we, um, what we have here are some traditional um, orders of survey, uh, and so we'll primarily focus on these right here. And so we have first order, second order, and third order, and within these orders we have different classes. Based on the amount of error that you have in your survey, that will help you determine the grade of your survey or the quality of your survey. Obviously, we would love for all of our surveys to be first order. I don't think we're all getting first order surveys in our first lab here in this class, but that'll be part of the um, what we do uh, in our um, in our uh, 
first labs is take the data you collect and classify it and see, is it a first order, is it a second order, third order, uh, what have you. And so to show you how that works, let me give you uh, an example of survey classification. Okay, so let me pull this up here. Um, there we go. Okay, so let's say that I have a 577.9 feet, dis uh, feet distance, and that's what was measured by the surveying crew. So the surveying crew went out and measured a distance, uh, and their measurement was 577.9 feet. But for the sake of surveying classification, we're going to assume that the distance that should have been 577.98 feet. Oh my goodness. This is what happens when you have teams um, attached to your, your office phone. So you get phone calls in class. My apologies. Okay. So we measure a distance that's 577.9 feet, but the actual true distance of what it should have been is 577.98 feet. Um, and so we're going to look at a given um, a set of questions. The first question I want to ask is what is the closure error? So what do you think the closure error is for this survey? 0.08. It's just a difference, right? So this is going to be... Um, so we'll just do this like this, five, I just, let's. Okay, so that's, that's the error. That's the closure error. Now, what is our relative accuracy? Well, our relative accuracy is the relationship, and so here's, here's how I'll do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say D over C, okay? And so this, this is how we would compute this, okay? And you'll, you'll, once you compute it and see the numbers, you'll go, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense, okay? So D in this case is our measured distance over our closure, and so we've got 577.9 feet over an error of 0 0.08 feet. And so what do you get for this? I know it's going to be kind of a messy number. 7,223. 7, 20, 20, 3.75? 4.75. 4, okay. And so one of the things I will point out is whenever you're doing relative accuracy, Significant figures don't really matter a whole lot, and you'll see why here in a bit, okay? So what I would say is that this survey is accurate for every one part per, I don't know, we'll call it 7,200 feet, you know, something like that. But that's, it's, it's accurate. But that's the amount of error you can expect. One unit of error for every 7,000 so units of measurement. Does that make sense? Actually, that part Okay. Now, as for the order and classification, here's why the significant figures don't matter a whole lot. The reason they don't matter a whole lot is if you go off of your survey classification here, let's put this, let's put this right here. I'll just blow this up. So in order to achieve third order class two, you need... Uh, a survey that's uh, that has error of at least one part in 5,000 or better, but for third order class one, you need one part in 10,000. So we haven't quite gotten here, so we're somewhere between here and here, which means we haven't yet met the standard for third order class one. In order to meet the standard of third order class one, we either need 10,000 or better. We're not there, we're only at 7,200, in which case we would classify this survey as the lowest grade, which would be third order class two. So, does that make sense?
So if this number was 10,000.1, it would be third order class one. If it was 9,999.3, it would be third order class two. It's got to be that or better. Make sense? Okay. So uh, this is probably, I would say, the other thing on the homework assignment that you're like, I don't know what's going on here. But it's probably a lot easier than you think. So. All right, does anybody have any questions on this? Okay. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention um, on the uh, uh, in the class was I just wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable with some of the basic uh, computations and basic mathematics uh, that we would be doing in this class. And I will level with you that the really the, the main two skills that you need in this class are algebra and trig. Um, I will probably only reference calculus like once, and even then, it's not even a necessity. It's just in case you had it, I can sort of uh, explain uh, a particular aspect of the class, and particularly I'm talking about curves. Um, you can explain vertical curves somewhat easily if you understand uh, derivatives and whatnot, but it's really not necessary. What I'm interested in is algebra and trig and, and how that relates uh, to geometry. So like, for example, um, things like if you have two intersecting straight lines, you all know that angle A and angle C are the same, and that angle B and angle D are the same. And then if you sum A, B, C, D, what do you get? There you go, 360 degrees. Um, if you have a parallel line cut by a transversal, you know that this angle, this angle, this angle, and this angle are all equal. That this, 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 and this angle are all equal. Just basic, you know, geometric observations. Um, Things like assessing triangles, like if you have a right triangle, how do you compute the length of the hypotenuse? How do you compute the area of the triangle? Um, I have here some shorthand formulas for how to compute the area of an oblique triangle. Um, not totally necessary, but if you can use them, uh, that'd be, uh, that'd be kind of nice. Um, things like uh, if I have a trapezoid, how do you compute the area of a trapezoid? You average the base A and base B, multiply it by the height. Um, how do you compute the area of a parallelogram or a rectangle or a square? Like, I just throw this stuff out here because, I mean, we are going to be looking at lot areas and, and uh, uh, areas related to excavations and earthwork and things like that. So you just, I mean, it's just stuff that I kind of expect you to know. I don't really plan on going uh, uh, into this in significant detail. Uh, we are going to be referencing some stuff later, uh, some specific terminology related to circles, uh, understanding what chord lengths are, um, radius diameter, all that junk, all that jazz. Um, the chord lengths and things like that, um, we express them a little differently when we look at, at horizontal curves, but I just want to throw out the terminology because we are going to see it uh, a little later. Um, things like what a central angle is, um, arc length versus sector areas, and things like that. This stuff doesn't really matter now. It will matter uh, a little later. Um, Volumes and whatnot. Probably the most common uh, formula that we'll see is just area times length for a prismoidal uh, shape because we'll use that for linear earthwork calculations or variations of that uh, when we do earthwork computations. Um, really, right now, I want to focus on trig. That's, that's kind of what my main core that I want you to be aware of now. That'll show up sooner rather than later. Uh, so making sure that you're familiar with... Um, Sine, cosine, tangent, Sakatoa. Um, we're not really going to use these all that much, but just make sure that you're familiar with them. Um, make sure that you're familiar with the law of sines and the law of cosines. Do y'all remember when you use one versus another? So you use the law of sines when you know a pair of opposite data. So like this angle and this side, if you know that, that's a, 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 a key to use the law of sines. The law of cosines is when you either know the data collected along one side of the triangle, or you know the lengths of all the sides, then you can use the, uh, the law of cosine. Make sure you know that the sum of the interior angles adds up to 180, you know, things like that. Um, a big one to be comfortable with is graphing. Make sure that you understand how Cartesian coordinates work, how you plot points. I mean, that might sound basic, but we're going to be doing a lot of that in this semester, so I want that to be uh, pretty comfortable when we start talking in northings and eastings uh, and things like that. Uh, make sure that you understand the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, make sure that you understand how to plot a line, point-slope formula, y equals mx plus b, all that. 
Um, that stuff on the homework, like I'm not, I don't really have any examples prepared for that because I feel like you all are, this is something I'm confident that you all have already seen. I just mentioned it because we're going to be seeing it here pretty soon. So um, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions um, about this the lecture and so far? All right, well, two things. Don't forget, you have a homework due Wednesday, um, and I'm going to pull up the code if you need it. I will see you all in class then.